Ever since the late 1700s, lighthouses have been placed at strategic spots along the East Coast to aid in navigation. They were particularly important around Cape Cod and the islands because of the dangerous shifting shoals and as beacons at the end of transatlantic voyages. The lighthouses helped, but shipwrecks in the area occurred at an alarming rate. Eventually, the Massachusetts Humane Society set up huts along the coast to give a wreck survivors a fighting chance. So these huts, four of which still survive today on Nantucket, had blankets, had foodstuffs, had a fireplace, but the most important ingredient was a piece of paper that told you where you were and how you could go for help. But finally, in 1871, there had been so many shipwrecks and so much loss of life so much cost to the owners of the ships in the loss of cargo and ships that the move was finally culminated with the creation of the U.S. Life Saving Service, the U.S. LSS. These would be equipped with six men and a keeper. They would be paid. Ultimately, they would be uniformed. They would be drilled weekly, and those drills perfected the techniques of rescue. There was an obvious need for life-saving here because of the tremendous number of vessels lost. Uh, there was always that uh, great source of uh, income from a shipwreck. If you look in my book, Maritime Nantucket, you'll see several shipwrecks uh, along which, uh, alongside of which you'll see some of the natives with their horse carts getting ready to unload the goods. They, they weren't slow about it, believe me. They did surf drills, they did signal drills, and they did what was called the beach apparatus drill, where the beach cart was taken out and they would practice rescuing people across the surf line. In the period from 1871 until 1915, when simply the name of this organization changes, just in that period alone, they saved 177,000 people. Now what you have to think of here is that this is a different America. The trailer trucks of that of today were the schooners of that era. There weren't any highways. The oceans were the highways. And this traffic was traveling 12 months a year, north and south, east and west. I was talking to Oney Dunham up here, lived just around the corner years ago, and he told me that one day he was on watch in the Coast Guard out there. He counted over 90 vessels going through Nantucket Sound during one watch. Imagine that. And I told this to Captain Chapel, who was Ruthie Greeter's father, who was a lobster fisherman, a nice old guy. And he said, well, he never bragged. He never raised his voice. He said, oh, I can beat that. He said, one day I counted well over 100. But you can't imagine the traffic that used to be going up and down this coast. And a place like Nantucket or other places along the coast all were suffering shipwrecks. But the different kinds of rescues really can be divided into two categories. Are you going offshore to rescue somebody? Or is that ship just across the breakers uh, on the other side of the surf line? And if he's on the other side of the surf line, you would take a beach cart, and then you would set up your beach apparatus, fire your shot line across the surf line, over the wreck, laying a shot line across the victim's reach. They, in turn, would grab that, and then you, in turn, would continue the process until you would finally set up a complete connection between ship and shore with taut hawser, or heavy line, and a breeches buoy that would then be hauled out to the ship. The first person jump in, and you would haul them ashore. Your other system is going offshore. And here you have the problems of launching through the surf or launching from some cove here in Nantucket, either a Monomoy or a Race Point would be the perfect boats because they were light enough that a crew could manhandle them through the surf. They were substantial enough that they could get offshore and they could pull in a number of men. So they, these people were the foundation for much of, of our maritime heritage that we don't give them credit for. Right on down until today's technology, of course, is a different kind of life saving. Then 
Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and the Elizabeth Islands, being islands with limited resources, have always relied on boats and ships for supplies and for ferry service. The first written record we have of uh, a ferry was when uh, Judge Samuel Sewell from Boston came down here on an inspection trip. And he went to what is what is Woods, it was then called Woods Hole, and he got in a rowboat and was was rowed across from from inner harbor of Woods Hole to what is now uh, Lambert's Cove on the north shore of the Vineyard, and that was apparently the the way that you came to the Vineyard. Uh, if the wind was blowing and if the tide was right, you sailed over with it. But the day he came, it was a calm day and they had to row most of the way. That's as far as we know, that, that's the written, first written record of a ferry boat. Uh, after that, they ran packets, uh, for mostly uh, from New Bedford, Fairhaven. The steamers started in... Uh first one started with the Eagle in 1818. She only lasted for a summer and then that died. And it was 10 more years before another steamer came along. And uh, that was called the Lafayette of the Hamilton. And that, that one was a, a underpowered little, these were all side wheelers. And they, of course, all came from New Bedford. Which uh, was a great change because they no longer were dependent on the tide and the wind, and uh, you could depend on the mail or whatever. A great deal of freight was brought down here in schooners as well. Uh, schooners, uh, which were not large, two and three masters, and the people here were used to going ashore uh, to the mainland in, in sailing vessels and packets. The people were, you know, afraid of the steamers because back in the early days, the steamers had wooden boilers, and it was not uncommon for them to explode. And uh, of course, with disastrous results when that happened, the steamers took over the passenger trade uh, as they became more acceptable. The coastal trade survived until it was entirely taken over by the steamship lines. Now, the steamship lines were all privately owned companies. Actually, the state does not own this line. Although it's called the authority, it's still backed by private capital. And they call it the steamship company today, although there's not a steamship in it. The last steamship was the big old Noshon, which had been the Nantucket. She was the last fully powered steam passenger vessel on the east coast of the United States. We still have some freight, like gravel, uh, coming in in barges, but the majority of the freight is brought over here in trucks, which are carried on board the various vessels that are owned by the, the authority. Nowadays, the trip to Nantucket by water has been cut in half with the introduction of a catamaran known as the Fast Boat that cruises along at over 30 knots and has replaced the old ship's wheel with a video game type joystick. The island scenery has always drawn yachters from all over New England and the world, with each location offering a unique boating experience. Sailing and boating is, is uh, a a wonderful way for people to get to the island. We have uh, four accessible harbors for them to come in and stay and either moor or get a slip right in uh, the activity in the thick of it all. Uh, Menemsha would be a much quieter uh, harbor, a uh, very, very beautiful, quaint fishing village with the most incredible sunset that you could ever imagine. Uh, Oak Bluffs is much more um, of a nightlife and uh, colorful sort of harbor, uh, very, very busy in the summer. It is just overloaded with boats. Um, Vineyard Haven has a beautiful harbor that is protected by a seawall, and uh, many more sailboats go into Vineyard Haven. It's a little bit quieter. 
And then we have Egertown, um, which once again is more in the line of Oak Bluffs. It has nightlife, a beautiful harbor that sits uh, in between uh, the island and Chappaquiddick. Expensive pleasure craft have almost completely replaced fishing boats in Nantucket. The harbor filling to capacity on almost every summer weekend. Cuddy Hunk's yachting experience differs from the bigger islands with a more relaxed atmosphere and fewer amenities. The yachting group is really a very good group and does provide income for our, our island people, a much needed income. Uh, there are really two groups. There are the ones, there are the sailors, the ones that uh, go by wind power, and then there are also the um, the motorboat group. Every night in July and August, you have probably a good 60 boats coming in for the night to tie up uh, or to moor, who have to come ashore to go to the bathroom, to walk their dogs, to hopefully find a four-star restaurant, which they don't. They will come in and uh, be surprised, one, that it's a dry island, two, that there is no ATM machine, that they find this very difficult to handle, and that often the phones are difficult to get. In the height of the summer, you've got a lot of people there uh, from 6 at night until 10 in the morning who move on to Martha's Vineyard where they get a four-star restaurant. And then uh, another group come along the next night and fill, take their places. For those in a hurry, several airlines run scheduled service to the two bigger islands. Private planes and jets have become so popular that Nantucket has become the second busiest airport in Massachusetts, with the vineyard not far behind. <laughs> 